welcome, 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 welcome. All, this is the best thing ever. You know, we often think of 2020 as just not the place to be, just this horrible thing. But just think, because of 2020, we're all on this Zoom with all of these incredible authors in one place at the same time, no matter where you are in the world. I'm serious, that's some amazing stuff. But enough about that, let's get on to these authors. I'm gonna do a quick introduction. Well, not so quick because they are fabulous. Like their bios, I'm like, what? Y'all should be grateful that y'all get to hang out with these people. Let me start with Miss Linda, Miss Nancy Johnson. Linda, she got off, but this is Nancy. This is Nancy's book, The Kindest Lie. Nancy is a native of Chicago's South Side, where she's worked for more than a decade as an Emmy-nominated, award-winning television journalist at CBS and ABC affiliates in markets nationwide, a graduate of Northwestern University and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She lives in downtown Chicago and manages brand communications for a large nonprofit. The Kindest Lie is her first book. We also have Reclaiming Her Time. I know y'all recognize that face, but let me tell you about these two authors. Helena Andrews Dyer is a features reporter for the Washington Post, covering popular culture and politics in the nation's capital. She was a contributing editor to Exo Jane and her work has appeared in O, o Magazine, Mary Claire, Glamour, The New York Times, and The Washington Post Magazine, Essence and Out. Her first book, a memoir of essays, The Bitch is the New Black, was released in 2010, and she lives in D.C. And R. Eric Thomas, a senior staff writer for L.com, known for his viral columns on the words and wit of Representative Maxine Waters, including Maxine Waters will read you now. He's also the author of a memoir, Here for It, his work has appeared in the New York Times, W Magazine, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Philadelphia Magazine, and on Audible Sounds Like America podcast. In 2017, he was named Best Humorist in Philadelphia Magazine's Best of Philly issue. He lives in Baltimore. Our third, The Gone Dead by Chanel Benz. Chanel Benz has published short stories in Granada.com, Electric Literature, The American Reader, Fence, and The Covered, and is a recipient of the O. Henry Prize. Her short story collection, The Man Who Shot Out My Eye Is Dead, was published in 2007 by Echo. It was named the best book of 2017 by the San Francisco Chronicle and one of Electric Literature's 15 best short stories best short story collections of 2017. It was also long listed for the 2018 Penn and Robert Brigham Prize for debut fiction. She's currently in, lives in Memphis where she teaches at Rhodes College. Last but not least, we bet, we're better than this. Represent, Representative Elijah Cummings was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. He obtained his bachelor's degree in political science from Howard University, serving as a student government president and graduating Phi Beta Kappa and then graduated from the University of Maryland School of Law. The congressman served 13 terms in the House, representing Maryland's 17 congressional district. He also served as the chairman of the committee on oversight and reform until his death in October, 2019, his widow, Maya, Dr. Maya Rockymore Cummings is the founder and president CEO of Global Policy Solutions, a firm that helps corporate, philanthropic, governmental, and nonprofit clients meet their strategic objectives. She is a strategist and an analyst, a political wonder and advisor with a talent for envisioning and agenda assimilation and implementation. Dr. Rocky Moore Cummins is also an accomplished speaker and author who continues the legacy of her late husband. So I am so grateful for all of you being here today. So for all the people who are just joining us, let me give you kind of an idea of how we're going to do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call out the authors and I'm going to give them about five minutes to kind of give us an insight into who they are and their wonderful, wonderful books. At the end, as mentioned by Linda Marie, we're going to do some Q&A. So 
let's get started with the delightful Nancy Johnson and the kindest lie. Thank you so much, Nicole. This is very exciting uh, to be here with all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I am Nancy Johnson and I'm the author of the debut novel, The Kindest Lie, which comes out February 9th from William Morrow, Harper Collins. And it is a story of race, class, family, and the pursuit of the American dream at the dawn of the Obama era. And the book itself is uh, about a woman named Ruth. She's a black engineer, uh, very successful, Ivy League educated and on the come up, uh, but she's harboring a secret. She gave birth to a baby when she was just a teenager, only 17 years old, and she left that baby behind in the dying Indiana factory town of her youth. So she goes back to her hometown to search for him. And when she gets there, she meets and forms this unlikely connection and friendship with Midnight, a young white boy who is also adrift, searching for his own sense of family connection. And he's mired in the very poverty that she managed to escape. And so when we put these two people together, we've got the forces of race and class that conspire to um, set them on this collision course and to upend both of their lives and really put the one person they've both grown to care about uh, in jeopardy. And so when I was conceiving of this novel, I had no idea that we would be having this national conversation on race that we've had uh, this year, or that you know we would be um, having this pivotal election uh, that just like 2008, so many people are hungering for uh, hope and change yet again. And so I opened the novel, The Kindest Lie, with the election night uh, of Obama. And my main character, Ruth, and her husband are having this fabulous election night party. And the sense of hope is very palpable. So I'm just going to read a very short um, excerpt from um, the middle of the opening chapter. Her whole life, Ruth hadn't dared to believe this could happen and she almost forgot to breathe. A picture of the little house where she grew up in Ganton came to mind, its low ceilings and narrow hallways. Mama at the kitchen table counting money on the first of the month. Papa's body quivering underneath his plant uniform as he tried to walk straight in the early days of his illness. Maybe, just maybe, everything they'd all been through had been for this, to get here, to this moment, to this man with the funny name, to this day in history. Xavier whooped and gave her a ball drop New Year's Eve style kiss. The townhouse vibrated with their jubilation. Guests lifted their glasses and their voices in a toast to their own manifest destiny. And out of the corner of her eyes, she saw Harvey, who was usually the loudest in any room, rocking quietly in a chair with his folded hands pressed against his lips. Then they rolled up the living room rug to do stepper sets and slides with Xavier breakdancing like he was 13 instead of 32. Somehow she needed to store every part of this moment, burn it into her being so it would still be real when she lived it again as memory. She wanted to scoop up this feeling, bottle it, and tighten the cap so none could seep out ever. But at the same time, her instincts told her to share it. So she opened the windows to give the neighborhood a contact high. And so that's just from uh, a piece of the opening um, of the book. And I wanted to examine the promise and the limits of hope at that particular time when Obama was elected. Because so many folks, you know, black and white and everybody was saying, you know, I think we're entering a post-racial era now that we've got a black president. And I knew right away that was a fallacy. Um, you know, all I had to do was look at my social media feed and just see the bitter divide between, between black and white America. And then you saw so much violence um, you know, visited upon Black people and Black bodies during Obama's presidency. Um, and so I wanted to uh, examine some of that and put characters into a situation that could interrogate some of those issues. And then in thinking about the theme tonight about Black voices, I was also interested in the full range of the humanity of who Black people are and show that on the page too. Um, you know, Ruth is a character, you know, who is very complex. You know, she's not somebody who needs saving. You know, typically in narratives, we see the well-to-do white person kind of coming in to save the black character. That's not the case here. Ruth is, like I said, complex and full of agency. And it's actually Midnight, the white boy who is in a lower socioeconomic situation. And we've also got um, Ruth's grandmother, who's a central character in the book, 78-year-old Black woman who makes questionable choices for the people she loves. But we also see her as a fully realized character at 78 years old who has unfulfilled dreams 
of her own and has a love interest. And that's something we don't usually see with black women of a certain age uh, on the page. So everybody is fully alive. And my greatest hope is that The Kindness Lie will spark important conversations for all of us uh, about race in America, open a dialogue for us and get us um, talking with each other and seeing people outside of their own um, typical experience. So again, comes out February 9th. Um, it's available for pre-order now, everywhere books are sold. And I just can't wait for everybody to read it so that we can start to have a conversation about it. Thank you so very much. Oh, thank you, Nancy. That was amazing. I am so excited for people to read your book as well. As you know, I've been on this journey with you, even though you didn't know I was there um, for over a year now. So to finally see you out and about with the book, talking it up, getting people excited, especially like you said, it's such an important, poignant time in our history. And so being able to examine it for how it was to where we are now. Mm-hmm. That is so amazing. And, you know, timing is everything. I mean, it, it really, really is. is. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I'm so excited. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So next, we are going to have a bit of a conversation with Helena Andrews Dyer and our Eric Thomas about our favorite auntie. So let's do this. Good evening. It's so good to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is R. Eric Thomas. I'm one of the co-authors um, of Reclaiming Her Time. And uh, one of the things that we, uh, one of the things that uh, drew us and drew so many people to this book is a representative Waters' book, uh, voice. Um, and so an evening about uh, focused on Black voices, uh, you know, it, it is the perfect time to talk about uh, this uh, representative who is not only somebody who is um, uniquely talented and uniquely powerful in, uh, uh, and, and, and pivotal in the history of the United States, um, but also has a really dynamic way of presenting herself. Absolutely, and I would just add, I'm Helena, um, uh, Eric's co-author, and I think a lot of people, just to talk very briefly about how this project came to be, Eric and I sort of knew each other. I interviewed him for a story um, that I wrote for the Washington Post because Eric had written all, you know, he's hilarious and is an amazing humorist. And he was one of the first people to sort of put Congresswoman Waters in this pop cultural context, um, you know, t- calling her Auntie Maxine and, and you know, writing about the press conferences she would have where she would call the press conference and then be like, it's over, it just walk away, you know? Um, and just her personality shining through so much and people being sort of surprised by that this time around, right? But what we learned in working on the book is that she has always been this, like mm-hmm. since a child, this is just who she is. And Day Street, uh, imprint of Harper Collins, our imprint that published Reclaiming Her Time, what they wanted, And what we actually really fought for was a book that went behind the meme, right? We say in our introduction, she is not your auntie, okay? She she has her own nieces and nephews. She's a full realized woman who has been fighting since the 60s, since she was an assistant teacher at Head Start, you know, in the wake of the Watts riots. She was, you know, she got elected to the California Assembly in 1976. She was at the National Women's Conference in the mid 70s. I mean, she was there um, as a Congresswoman after the LA riots, um, which she very pointedly did not call a riot, you know, walking the streets with President Clinton at the time. She is at every major inflection point in history, voicing, being a voice, as we talk about Black voices, being a voice of her community and a voice of her constituents. And what we found in our research and chatting with people is that that has been what is Congresswoman Waters staying power. One is she's so authentically herself. She unapologetically brings her full self to every single thing that she does. And through that is very much a voice of her community. And I wanted to read just a, 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 if I found the right page, um, just this one quote from her in the book. And then, and also to say the book is, it is not your boring political biography. (laughs) Maxine Waters does not deserve that. She, that is not her personality. That is not what she would ever have wanted. What we wanted to do is put her in a context, a cultural context and write a book that was very conversational, very, um, 
approachable about her. And this is a quote, um, and this is in the chapter about one of her first, her first run for the California Assembly. And after she had become a teacher at Head Start, she started to do what they were doing in the late 60s, these sort of encounter groups. I'm putting it in quotes because that's what they were called, encounter groups, where women would get together and just like talk about what was going on in their lives and what they were feeling. And this is, we've explained this in other things where it's like, this was new, right? Like millennials now, like, of course you talk about yourself. That's all we do all the time. This was very new at the time, these encounter groups. And this is what she found out about herself in one of the groups. In a quote from an interview, she says, I remember at some point deciding I had been silenced by this need to be liked and not wanting to step on anyone's toes or hurt anybody's feelings. What I discovered is I really don't care whether people like me or not. It freed me up. And that is, I mean, this is what she's finding out about herself in the 60s, right? And this is what has absolutely stayed with her for her entire career up until now. Um, and I feel like what we do in the book is just explain that, explain that she, she's she been this, she's been on this same thing and will continue to be on it because she, she's not retiring anytime soon. Um, and yeah, so it, it, it's, it's a fun book, it's a bold book. And um, I think everyone will sort of glean something from it, especially during this time. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so much. I, I would agree. Uh, when I saw this come across my desk, I thought, this is what I've been waiting for, that history book, that biography that's just going to sparkle. Because you know the nuggets have always been there, but they've been there in a way that made you take a nap versus a way that made you want to wake up and do something and understand more. So I do love this. And I, I can't wait till we get to our Q&A because I got, some, I got some words. All right. So our next author is Chanel Benz with Gone Dead. Hi. Chanel. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. Um, so in my book, I'll hold it up as well, The Gone Dead. Um, I, so in the book, The Gone Dead, um, the protagonist, Billy James, uh, is returning to a small town in the Mississippi Delta after inheriting her father's, her late father's tenant shack. And she hasn't been back for about 30 years since she was four years old. And so as she begins to explore the town and its people, she begins to uncover the truth surrounding her father's death. He was a black arts poet and a civil rights activist who had died in 1972. And the story is set in 2003. So one of the reasons I started writing about or got interested in writing about the Delta is um, I was living in Southwest Mississippi. There was not a whole lot to do. Um, and so in my boredom, I started just getting in the car and driving and looking for any sort of interesting places, especially historical places. And I was drawn in particular to the Delta um, the way it's beauty, it's lushness, but also the way it's this abandoned landscape. Um, and not unlike New Orleans, where when you're in New Orleans, it feels like any other time but 2020. Over here, it's 1816. Down here, it's 1932. Over here, it's 1989. Um, except in the Delta, it's rural, of course. And you can, I, for me, I can feel um, the layers of time. Time feels palpable there. The voices feel palpable there. It's a haunted space. Um, and I started reading about the history of the Delta. And in particular, I was drawn to um, civil rights era cold cases um, of men, of uh, black men, women, and children who had been murdered by white supremacists with impunity. Sometimes the Klan, sometimes not. And I was struck by how many of these lives and deaths had been forgotten or omitted um, by the historical records and how so many of these families had, um, you know, almost across the board, maybe with an exception of two or three, had never had anything like justice. And a lot of these lists of names were on these really kind of beta um, websites that have been created in a, out of a labor of love in like 1996, you know what I mean? And that was it, just their names. And some of them, their stories were really hard to trace. Um, and, you know, I said that they hadn't had any justice, although many of them know who did it, knew who did it, right? They're in these small spaces. They know who did it. They know people who witnessed it. And so I think what really got me and what really enrages me is how the gener these generations of Black families have suffered the loss, the indignity, the grief, 
while the perpetrators and their families and their enablers have controlled the narrative. And so when I think about the Delta, I think about the way people speak. I think about the stories they tell, their storytellers. I think about the songs they sing, the prayers, the protests. I think about the voices, the voices that haunt and speak across the space. So I wanted to write a story that is about one of these injustices, one of these deaths that people have forgotten or they never had to know except for the people who are still carrying it. I wanted to care, I wanted to counter those kind of master narratives with these other black voices. So I'm just gonna read a little excerpt. So this is actually um, Avalon, it's from the perspective of Avalon, which was a juke joint that her father used to go to with his friends. And so it's from the perspective of the juke joint itself. This house was once a house. Seen a girl made a mother, a boy become a father who come and go, come and go. Seen a son work the land, the land flood and ruin him and the bodies floating in it. Seen a woman rush home to check on her loose children, a white boy close by her side, another kind of son, devoted for now to his mighty black mother. Seen a child burned by a pot of boiling water on the stove, seen these walls newspaper to keep out the cold. Heard children singing, laughing, running into the sun to chase a bullfrog. Heard a baby offer up a word for the first time. Heard the silence after underwater drinking and the fish hook whine of hunger from a small belly. Heard the knock of white men looking for a boy hiding at his uncle's house. Heard shots in the night, far off, but always too close. And heard weeping, too much weeping, too damn much of the time. Once there was only the th rumble, once there was only the rumble of thunder, split of rain, pulse of locust, the sounds day makes turning over into night. I heard tell of an army of wretched people, hardly clothed, who cleared the break and swamp and panther, who built and served and escaped only when they died. Their children came here to sweat out the demons that are carried in the body. This girl, she comes wanting to know about a night in 1972 when the Isley brothers were panting paradise for their queens and the Detroit Emeralds were asking all those babies to let them take them into their arms. Yeah. But what can these walls say? Listen, girl, everything you want to know is near, telling itself over again. The song is on repeat. Thank you. Wow. Wow, that's that is amazing, and I'm I'm getting a little chill because I do love a Southern Gothic. I felt that. <laughs> I did. I felt that. Um, that was amazing. That was amazing. Um, next, we have the wonderful Dr. Maya Rocky Moore Cummings to talk about. We're better than this. Thank you, Nicole. It's my pleasure to be with you this evening to talk about We're Better Than This, my late husband's book. Uh, as most of you know, he passed away in October of last year. Uh, and when he passed away, he had about 90% of his book complete. Um, I actually wrote the afterword, the last chapter of the book. The book is about life, it's about love, it's about leadership, and it's about liberty uh, in basically the Trump years. Uh, Elijah grew up in the Jim Crow South, and he grew up from, uh, you know, as you well know, an African American in Maryland, uh, which was absolutely south of the Mason Dixon line. So he knew what it was like to have to go to separate and unequal schools, uh, to have to, um, you know, uh, basically be an outcast uh, in his own country. Uh, and so what you see in this book is the arc of a man who goes from being the penultimate outsider. Uh, to being the ultimate insider, uh, using and leveraging the tools of the law and the civil rights movement uh, to basically challenge the system and to rise up to become one of the most powerful members of the US Congress. Uh, and so the question becomes is how does he do that? How did he do that? Uh, and this book takes us through how the importance of his family and his faith uh, and certainly the life lessons that he learned from his parents and from his community uh, actually led him to, of course, uh, become a, uh, a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Howard University, uh, to go on to become a, uh, a University of Maryland Law School graduate, uh, passing the bar on the first time, then becoming a Maryland a House of Delegates uh, politician, 
uh, becoming the first ever African-American speaker pro tem uh, in the Maryland House of Delegates, and then rising to become a US Congressman, ultimately becoming the chairman of the Government and Oversight Committee. Now, Elijah arrived in Congress in 1996, which was in the middle of the Clinton years. And certainly uh, he experienced a lot through the Clinton years, through the Bush years, and also through the Obama years. Uh, and I was his partner in the Obama years and saw all of that. But this book really focuses on the Trump years, uh, you know, where he viscerally faced the lar the, a huge threat uh, you know, from a man uh, in his administration who was trying to turn back the hands of time in our country uh, and to roll back the gains of the civil rights movement, to roll back everything that Elijah and friends like John Lewis uh, fought for. Uh, and so Elijah was on the front lines of trying to battle Donald J. Trump uh, and having to do it from the position of being the chairman uh, of the Government Oversight and Reform Committee, which is the committee in the US House of Representatives, which actually oversees all of the investigations into the administration. So he had a front row seat in terms of, you know, the, the family separation at the border, you know, the Russian interference in the 2016 mm -hmm. elections, you know, Jared and Ivanka using personal emails and personal servers to do government business. And yes, that happened. Uh, you know, um, all of these investigations, uh, you know, including the racist question on U.S. Census. I mean, you name it. Elijah was there. A lot of the lawsuits uh, where he sought to challenge, you know, everything from, uh, you know, uh, Trump's taxes and finances. Uh, you know, we saw, you know, coming out of, uh, you know, that came out of his committee. Uh, and so with that, you know, it really is the story of a man uh, who basically uh, rises up to go against the system, but then also to defend the system. Uh, because ultimately, at the end of the day, it's about saving democracy. And this book was largely a warning to the American people that we cannot allow the forces of illiberalism uh, we cannot allow basically uh, authoritarian leaders to come uh, and, and basically try to take apart our constitution brick by brick to try to destroy our democratic norms and to use our legal system not to do justice, but to actually perpetuate injustice. And so Elijah's story is the, uh, I think, a story of the ages uh, and is certainly one that I encourage all of your readers to, uh, to, to read. Uh, because it contains uh, just, just tremendous nuggets uh, about his life, but also about our country. Mm -hmm. uh, and so with that, I'm just going to just briefly end with a, a short story uh, that he told about his youth, uh, a, a penultimate a situation that changed his life forever. Uh, he was influenced by a lot of women, and this woman was Juanita Jackson Mitchell. She was the first ever woman who practiced law, African-American woman who practiced law in the state of Maryland. And she came to Elijah's segregated pool when he was just 11 year old little boy with all of the other African-American uh, boys and girls and asked them if they wanted to go and swim in a pool. And so what Mrs. Mitchell did not tell us that day about the nice pool she was taking us to was that it was totally segregated, no blacks allowed. She and her colleagues at the rec center, Jim Smith and Walter Black, we're leading us on an integration march. There we were, a band of little kids walking down the streets of Baltimore from a black neighborhood to a white neighborhood, only a few blocks from each other, but worlds apart. Day after day, Juanita and Jim and Walter led about 30 of us walking 10 or 15 blocks while an angry mob, not of other kids, but of grown white adults yelled names at us, told us to go home and threw rocks and bricks at little kids. One of those rocks struck me in the forehead and caused a scar that I carry to this day. The police watched and the newspapers took pictures and ran stories, but nobody stopped the angry residents and nobody stopped us. Walter Black, who was inspired by these events to go on to the law school and then work for the NAACP, today lives on Maryland's Eastern shore and still recounts the incident. And I will skip and just say this. We kids would swim in the Riverside Park pool each day, then leave with our neighbors yelling racial epithets and throwing debris in bottles and white kids pushing black kids in the pool. 
I call them neighbors ironically. Yes, we all lived within blocks of each other, but they were hardly neighborly. They were the opposite, people trying to keep us out of our neighborhood. Tensions were high. After taking Sunday off, they let us all back again on Monday, Labor Day, September 3rd. That day, someone called Walter's associate, Lyle Roberts, a nigger, and with the hostility escalating, the police urged the NAACP leaders to ride out of the area in a police wagon for their safety, which they resisted but eventually agreed to. About that time, the Riverside Park citizens clinging to their segregated white enclave must have realized that we were all just gonna keep coming back because they stopped coming to their doorways and out into the street shouting and throwing rocks. And just as Juanita Mitchell promised, we all got to go to a real pool. And as she said, we swam to our heart's delight. Even as little children, we had a sense of victory, victory and fear. We'd gone off every day to play, but we ended up making history. Wow, wow. So with that, um, you know, Elijah's story is an incredible one. Uh, it's largely set in Baltimore and Washington, D.C., uh, but it's, it's about our era and the time that we're living in. Uh, and he's basically arguing that we're better than what the Trump administration had to offer this nation. We're better than the division. We're better than the hate. That we, looked, we need to look forward to a nation that's diverse, inclusive, and equitable for all. Thank you so much for that reading. Um, I, I got to read uh, a good portion of the book and I read your part and my heart is so full for you. Um, I'm so grateful that you are here to continue such a beautiful and strong legacy. Um, we are just honored to have you here and all of our authors here. So at this time, I want to remind our audience to, if you have any questions or comments or thoughts, please write them in the chat. Um, why you have this unbelievable panel of wonderful people kind of experiencing and expressing uh, the Black voice. And I love that it's not just one genre, it's fiction and nonfiction together. You hardly ever get that mix. Um, again, man, some good points about Rona, you know, it's just bringing all kind of folks together. Um, so I'm going to ask some questions, but again, I really want to, to give the audience an opportunity um, to, to talk, but I'm going to start with Nancy first, since that's where we began. Um, and speaking of voices, your chapters are in alternating voices from Ruth and the young white man, um, white boy, uh, Midnight. There is a line in the book, it's actually like a little, little, little bit of a paragraph that I love so much. And if you don't mind, I'd like to read it because I wanna talk about it. So this is when some things have happened and Ruth goes to have a conversation with Midnight. And this is what she says, yet he was just a child and maybe he deserved her forgiveness. Being black, she came from a long line of people who were expected to forgive reflexively, but she couldn't do it. She hadn't sat long enough with what all that had happened to set him free, not just yet. So she gave him what she could, her understanding. That little bit was so powerful to me, especially thinking about the world that we're living in, especially listening to all of you speak about the political state, the racial state, and you know, my point out uh, COVID. When you wrote that, what were you thinking about to put it in that particular context? Yeah, that was a very difficult um, scene for me to write. I mean, I have this relationship between, or friendship between a black woman and then this white boy, because they both are bonded by this need for um, family connection and they need the same things. And yet, and that's what brings them together. Yet this white boy does something that is unforgivable um, in her mind in the book. And I didn't know how to, I grappled a lot with, what I wanted to do with that, with their relationship, you know, toward the, right after the climax of the book, you know, how I would resolve it. Um, would she forgive them, him, and they just move on. And I thought back to a lot of my own experiences. Um, you know, I talked, or you mentioned that I had a career in news. You know, I, mm -hmm. my very first job in news, I would come in the newsroom every day and there was a white photographer who would say, here comes Nancy, there goes the neighborhood. Um, you know, I worked in another um, station where a white photographer called me um, a nigger. 
Um, you know, I bought a house in Florida and uh, was checking on the new construction and saw, you know, we don't want the N word here, you know, scrawled in the um, drywall. So there have been so many experiences. These are just overt racism. Obviously there's the more subtle kind, mm -hmm. but I've just had so much of that in my own life and my own history. And I've always struggled with, you know, can I really forgive that? Do I want to forgive that? Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes forgiveness is some, you know, a gift that we do give to ourselves, but I think it's really understanding where it comes from. And that's what gives me a sense of peace with it. Mm -hmm. um, even if I'm not able to actually forgive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've seen so many incidents just, you know, in our history, you know, here in this country in recent years where, um, black people are applauded so quickly for forgiving. And I think it's an individual choice. Um, you know, after that, um, the church shooting, you know, in Charleston, you know, there, were, there was that moment of forgiveness and which was, you know, a beautiful thing to witness. But I think there was just this expectation among so many that that's just gonna naturally happen, that that's what black people are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to show a different um, way of looking at this as, you know, that it's not just reflexive. You know, it takes a lot to get to that point of forgiveness. And that's not something that you should expect from me. Yeah. And that's what I loved. It was so fleshed out and it felt so real. Yeah. I think so many of us have had those experiences, those subtle and overt where you are, you know, in a situation where you like, what, what, what do I do? What do I do and what I feel? And so just to be able to articulate it in that little bit was just so beautiful and it was like I felt myself just kind of sigh or relief like yeah that's it right there I can give them that I don't have to do anything else in this moment it is just uh I love it I love it I'm so excited these people will be able to get your book in February so I'm talking about <laughs> and they can pre-order now though and pre-order now <laughs> from an independent local bookstore let's right. keep it straight <laughs> um Helena and and Eric uh reclaiming her time just kind of piggyback on the conversation that I just, the question I just had for Nancy, talking about a fully fleshed out individual who been at this for a minute. When I'm looking at this and reading it, like I said, I was so excited. Just, just the, the packaging of it is just so unique. Um, and like you say, very deserving of the, of the individual that there is, but you have, uh, a beautiful bit that I, I highlight and I want to say as well. So you write, all this is important to understand about Auntie Maxine character was born out of that exchange, an exchange that it was, you know, the Auntie Maxine reclaiming her time, that, that exchange. And you like, sure, sounded sassy, resistancy, but was in the end, completely routine. Completely routine when you look at it. The woman was just doing her job. Oh my goodness. I often tell people, especially young people, uh, when they're looking at tweets and memes and uh, Facebook just captions, that that's nowhere near the whole story, that there is such a richness behind it. When you were researching this and putting this all together, what about this woman who'd been in the game for a very, very long time allows her to connect to people who are used to just teeny tiny snapshots of information? Well, I'll jump in and, and say um, like her dynamism um, is uh, uniquely calibrated to our moment, um, but it's not been, it's not like she is uh, some sort of internet flash in the pan. She has a, uh, a way of speaking. We wrote a lot about her way of speaking throughout the book um, that is so compelling and it's rooted in a lot of uh, uh, black vernacular traditions, but it's also rooted um, in uh, some of just the great orators of, uh, of human history. She's a fantastic speaker um, and she's good at uh, speaking at length and she's also good at the soundbite. And so when you have somebody who is so um, 
gifted at speaking and communicating themselves and adding just a little bit of, of flavor to that speech that is just so natural. It comes from who she is and where she was raised and in the context in, in which she grew up. Um, and then you, you add to that uh, a, like a brilliant mind. Um, I often say that she's, you know, one of the reasons that Limo Miranda wrote Hamilton uh, is because Hamilton was a great speaker and a great uh, thinker. And I think somebody should write the, a Hamilton about Maxine Waters because she is as brilliant um, and in, in her understanding of how government works and how people's minds work and the fusion of those two. And I think that's why you get great memes, but you also get a great leader who is able to actually affect change as opposed to just showing up on the news and saying nothing as some some leaders do, unfortunately. Truth. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, when it comes to your question about like how she can connect, um, I had Eric and I both took snippets of her life and themes and sort of like ran with them um, to, to create the book, obviously. And I had talked to some of the people who work with her on her first campaign. And one of the things they said is that she, she knew everybody. Like when it comes to her constituents and her district and her district has been redrawn a bunch of times, gerrymandering and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, but she knew those people so well because she still, she still considers herself that person, right? She, this is a woman who grew up the fifth of 13 children. Mm -hmm. They raised by a single mother who was on you know, government assistance, mostly her entire childhood, you know, and had to live in public housing at times. Like they, she still, I think that is very much, that isn't just her story. And then she pulled herself up by her bootstraps and forgot all about that. Right. That is indelibly who she is as a person. So she connects with people um, on that level and knows, you know, it's, it's, there's authenticity. We often say that about politicians. Oh, are they authentic? authentic enough you know and it gets used as, as this cliche but she is very much that and I think when we hear her speak truth to power when we hear her say you know I'm not going to inauguration I don't honor him I don't respect him. you know she's saying what everybody is thinking and yeah. she's just saying it to Eric's point she's saying it so succinctly so so you know intelligently but within like literally like five words um and just everybody gets it and that's always been sort of who she is. She she credits a lot of that in interviews to her mother, um, who she says, you know, they, they didn't have an easy relationship when she was growing up because, you know, you're a single mom of 13 kids at a time. You can't dole out a bunch of love and kisses and hugs to everyone, right? right. Um, but she says what her mother taught them all was essentially closed mouth, don't get fed, say what you need, say what you want and say it and speak it clearly. Um, and she says, you know, we didn't know that everybody didn't talk like, you know, we didn't know that that's not how every kid was taught and that's how she was taught. And I think that that just comes through and has continued to come through um, her work. And, and that's what people connect to just the fact that this woman, you know, she says what she thinks and, um, and she doesn't apologize for it ever. Yeah. <laughs> No, she doesn't. I wish somebody would say, you're okay, boomer to her, because they might not make it. <laughs> um, and I do appreciate that she does say what she thinks, but what she thinks is thoughtful. Yeah. It's not just rambling. It's not just thoughtless and careless. It's very intentional how she mm -hmm. speaks and what she speaks about. And that is just, could we have more of that, please? from everybody, you know, well, since we in the house thinking deep thoughts, how about that? <laughs> um, thank you both. Chanel, back to my Southern Gothic, that's what I'm talking about. And we've been, when I think of Southern Gothics, you usually think of like the Faulkners of the world. And then if I want to transition that, then I'll go to like Ernest Gaines for African-American uh, Gothic. But then we have you and this really beautiful, beautiful book. Um, and since this is about black voices and not only are you giving voices to a variety of different characters, you're also giving voices to inanimate objects like the, the shack and the juke joint, which is amazing. But you blend genres inside of the book. There's a poem that I thought was really, really beautiful that if you don't mind, I'm going to read because I feel like it really connects the story to the earth and to the voices of the people. So it's, it's big muddy. <laughs> so I came back because I had to, 
I came back because blood called and it was my blood already in the ground. The land called to say, I am your ancestors. The land called and said, young blood, I am the lady of the house. I came back because we did not know your name, your names, all the names in the river, in the ground, those who never got to know that somebody, heirs of their body would come back for them. How important is it for us to remember the voices, the voices of the people in our community, the voices of the places where we belong, whether we remember it or we don't? Um, thank you so much for reading that poem. No one really ever points out the poems of the story. Um, <laughs> and I'm beautiful. not a poet, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, since the Emmett Till Act, where the FBI quote unquote reinvestigated, and I use that word as with bitter irony, um, the some civil rights era cases, most of the people who were perpetrators who were there, who witnessed are no longer with us. And so one of the things that I was thinking about is how do we, how do we get any sense of justice for those lives that were taken um, that have been forgotten or omitted or silenced? And I think that it is in, we tell their stories, right? We counter those narratives we make the anonymous, the marginalized known, we bring their stories out to the light and we pass it on. Mm. And we take back history and we push back against um, the erasure of these stories, the erasure of who built this country, the erasure of whose blood is in the foundations of black and indigenous voices. And, um, and we talk back. And so I think, you know, there, there are so many times where I'm reading some of these stories where I'm still surprised by what I don't know, what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, I mean, to say that the, there aren't people alive, there are all, all, also people who are alive, who remember their uncle, who um, there are a lot of stories when I was doing my research that aren't even, you know, a, a name on the internet, who haven't been told, who, um, when different journalists are doing research who they have people coming up to them saying, hey, I wanna tell you about my uncle, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think, you know, bringing out these narratives, a lot of the work that the, you know, Equal Justice in Initiative has done and work like that, like etching people's names, having memorials, marking, mm -hmm. physically marking um, these stories, these names, these voices. I think it's very important to, um, bring these stories into history. And so I think remembering these voices is central to uh, the reckoning. Like there, there can be no re reconciliation, right? Without the reckoning, you mm -hmm. have to do that. For some people, you have to do that repentance work. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was amazing. I, I had actually been able to go to the Whitney Plantation a few years ago and I saw the walls with the slave names on it where they went back and they researched it and put those names down, giving those people the honor that they deserved. And so reading your book and just feeling that all over again, and people don't often think they can get that from fiction. They often think they have to go through, you know, something very difficult, um, uh, historical documents and comb through, but fiction can tell so many wonderful stories. Thank you for this. I appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Maya, Dr. Maya. Uh, as I read your book, um, what came across that I thought more people should know and more people should spend some time with was Elijah as the human being man person. Uh, oftentimes when we have people like uh, Representative Maxine or Representative Cummings, we, we see them as these, these figures that are untouchable and impossible, which makes it easier for us to go, I can't do that. I can't do that. I'm, I'm just, you know, uh, a regular person just, you know, living my life, but failing to see them as we all are regular people. And that's one of the things that really spoke to me in this story. I think about the work that he did um, around healthcare and how important that was to people. So reading about his father coming home 
and sitting in the car just just touched me so much. So um, we know we talk oftentimes about healthcare as the physical body, but in this little snippet, he talks about healthcare as a mental bit. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read a little bit of that because I think people need to hear this. I'm hoping that these little snippets get people excited and get them coming. So he talks about his father coming home from work and not walking directly in the house. He just sits in the car and everybody knew not to bother him. Just leave him sitting in the car. And Elijah said that he stayed for a full hour, a full hour. And we kids wanted him to come in, but we knew better than to bother him. Years later, I learned what he was doing out there. He told me he was letting the day's indignities pass, allowing the anger and the pain to diffuse, giving the venom of insult and disrespect time to leave his body and his mind before coming into his family. Oh, that just, oh, that touched my heart because it is, it's, it's the physical health as well as the mental health. When people are reading this, when they are, you know, digesting the, the, the spaces in this book and, and examining who he is and who you were together, because that's an important part of the man, what do you want people to get out of that? What do you want, what action would you like to see come from the reading? I think you're still on mute. I think that it's important to understand that, you know, so I, I know Maxine Waters. I knew John Lewis. <laughs> I was Mr. Wrangell's chief of staff. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, the love of my life was Elijah Cummings. Um, and these are all everyday people who have, and now Elijah always used to say, I'm just an ordinary man called to an extraordinary mission. Um, and, you know, and I always counter that, no, I actually do think you're an extraordinary man, <laughs> <laughs> but he was so humble. He was so humble and he walked his walk, uh, with the humility of, you know, um, uh, of knowing that, you know, he was the fourth generation from slavery, knowing mm. that his people have suffered so greatly in this country, knowing that they continue to suffer so greatly in this country, mm -hmm. knowing that there are injustices that are happening all across this land and trying to dedicate his life, just like Maxine, just like, uh, you know, John Lewis. I mean, these are people who are dedicating their lives because public service is no joke. You are on yeah. beck and call. You are in a, you know, you are under incredible scrutiny. Uh, and in the era of Donald Trump, I mean, Elijah and I and our family and our city was even attacked, uh, you know, death threats constantly. I mean, just to serve the people and the people are always in need. They're asking, they're wanting, they're needing. Uh, they always have something that they want. Uh, and that means that you have to be on beck and call to serve while doing your job, while, you know, um, maintaining, you know, your sense of self, uh, trying to maintain a family unit, trying to make sure that you're doing everything in your power uh, to give back. Uh, these are extraordinary people who are dedicated. They're mm -hmm. regular people, but they are extraordinary in that they have uh, given their lives to, to try to serve. Mm -hmm. And so with Elijah, I think that what I want people to understand is that, you know, all of us, and he wanted young people especially to understand mm -hmm. that, you know, he's had incredible challenges to overcome in life. He was labeled special education as a child. You know, he went to separate and unequal schools early in his mm -hmm. youth. He had, he had a longstanding 25 year plus uh, battle with cancer. Mm -hmm. And he continued to get up every day and fight the battle for mm -hmm. the people. Yes. and fight the battle for our democracy. And so, you know, we all have an obligation, I think, um, you know, he, the baton has been passed, mm -hmm. uh, Elijah and John, uh, and, you know, frankly, others uh, soon. <laughs> and, yeah. and we have to just continue the walk and continue to fight. Oh, that just, mm, that's beautiful. That, you know, it, not just the obligation, but the potential too. Everybody has this great potential within them. And that was one of the things that I think really unified all of these stories, the fiction and the nonfiction, bringing it all together is that these voices matter. These people's story matter. And you are reading these stories, you matter too. 
you matter too. You see their fullness uh, come alive when people are reading and getting inspired by all of these things. I do have one more question. And that is as full as all of these are, was there anything that did not make it into your book that you like, oh, I'm gonna have to use that the next time? Anybody? Don't be shy. <laughs> So let me just say this, in terms of Elijah's book, it was written in collaboration with, an, uh, with a writer named James Dale. Mm -hmm. And he and Elijah worked furiously for about a little over a year uh, to actually prepare the book. So any, and, and everything did not make it in, um, <laughs> uh, but I don't actually know everything that did not make it in. So I can't gotcha. answer that fully. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. I have one thing that made it in at the very last minute. Um, so, you know, as, as all of you know, uh, you know, it takes quite a while to get a book, especially a book as well designed as Reclaiming Her Time uh, together and ready for publication. Um, but we knew that, you know, some part of the, the story of Maxine Waters climaxes with in, inside the, the presidency of Donald Trump. Um, mm -hmm. They have been uh, such adversaries. He not really a worthy adversary for her, um, but you know she dispatched him before he was even inaugurated. Um, but uh, one of the very last things that we snuck into the draft was uh, were her remarks on the floor of the House uh, during the impeachment hearing, and uh, it was very exciting to watch that as an American um, and as somebody who has spent so much time uh, pay, uh, you know paying attention to the words of of Representative Waters. Um, and I was really, really glad that we were able to get it into the book um, because from a narrative point of view, um, it's really satisfying. And it's also, it's just a, a great piece of oration. It's a fantastic speech. It is, it is. It was so powerful. Then you're just sitting there like, man, I need to talk more like that. Like that's gotta be free. Like that's gotta be what's like keeping her looking so good too. Like she's just getting all that out of her system. She's not carrying that weight. Oh, that's just amazing. <laughs> Um, thank you all so much. We are we are right on time, and I am so grateful for all of you being here. Um, I just want to thank Harper Collins. I want to thank Ingram Content Group and SEBA, the Southern Southern Independent Book Alliance. All of you wonderful authors with your amazing bios who took some time to come out and hang out with us. Do not forget how much we love you, readers. We hope that things were said and discussed that make you wanna rush right out to your laptop on your cell phone to buy one of these or all of these amazing books from your local independent bookseller. Okay, one more time, everybody hold up your book so people can see it, smile for the camera. So how gorgeous you are. I'm going to take a picture because, you know, we live in that in this world. So we got to take a picture because we look beautiful. Look at this. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you all so much. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. And I look forward to maybe, you know, hanging out with you all again. Take care. Good night. Bye.